Hello, Bethel friends and family. Pastor Joe here. You know today's Wednesday, so we need to dig into God's Word together. I hope you spent some time this week on your own or maybe with a great friend, a spouse, a child, uh, reading God's Word. It is the thing, uh, the sustenance of life. Uh, we know the scriptures say that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. It is his word that enables us to live, that fills us and makes us whole. Well, we're going to dig into the word in just a moment. Um, we're working through the, the book of Galatians, and it's really a, a tremendous argument um, where people are wrestling with can I earn my salvation or should I receive my salvation as a gift? And I hope you understand that we cannot earn our salvation. We must receive it as a gift. And so um, <laughs> I got to thinking about how dumb we can get. Uh, maybe I should just talk about myself, but uh, I actually saw something interesting on the news. I think it was yesterday or the day before. Senate passes bill to make daylight savings time permanent. Now, I don't know about you, but this week, listen, when you do the time change, does it not make you crazy? Does it not mess with your mind? I mean, can't we just leave things alone? And it was interesting. One of the senators I saw was being interviewed. He says, why do we keep doing this stupid thing over and over? And there was a lot of discussion. Uh, there was some a uh, senator from Connecticut up north or somewhere, and he said, so when uh, daylight savings time comes in or goes, however it works, he says, my folks are driving home at four o'clock. It gets dark. So when they get home, if they're leaving work at five, they're driving home in the dark. Why would we do that to people? And so the word stupid came up a lot. And I, I've got a friend who loves to say those stupid idiots. But anyway, <laughs> We often, and I should just speak for myself, we often do dumb, dumb things. And I don't know if daylight savings time was dumb or great. All I know, it's it's a bit of a headache for me. Um, I remembered a sermon uh, that a, a, a great youth pastor, David Cornwell, preached probably in 1993 or 92. Oh, boy, that was some years ago. Um, it was called One More Night with the Frogs. One More Night with the Frogs. And, you know, to this day, I've not forgot that sermon. It was when um, the Israelites had left uh, Egypt. God had delivered them. And now they're out in the wilderness, you know, and they're out trekking along. And, and they just start complaining about everything. And they said, man... When we were back in Egypt, we had it made. Yeah, we had to work seven days a week, and we got beaten, and we had cruel taskmasters, but it was sure a lot better than wandering through the wilderness. Now, I don't know about you. I like to go camping, <laughs> and I don't know if that's wandering through the wilderness, and they had a pretty good setup going, I do believe. They had plundered the Egyptians. They had uh, cattle. They had, they had everything going for them, but we tend to to complain and often think of the past, even if it was horrible, as better. And I don't know about you, but I, I've, I've got friends that, that remember back to high school as the best days of their lives. And I just remember high school was horrible for me. Um, it was a great time of awkwardness and struggle and trying to figure out who I was. I wouldn't go back there for a gazillion dollars. I don't. Maybe you'd love to go back. But often we want to go back to what's familiar, maybe what we thought was easier, maybe it was a, a, a different time in life. And we always think going back is better than going forward. So this text we're going to look at in Galatians chapter 4 is when these people who have met Jesus decide it'd just be better to go back before they had met Jesus, in a way, in a sense, because they thought, well, maybe instead of just enjoying Jesus and being in a relationship with him, maybe we ought to do a bunch of work stuff and earn our right to be saved. Well, that will never happen. So we need to have a Bible study. The Bible study, one more night with frogs. Thank you, David Cornwell, uh, great great youth pastor, just lost his dad recently, and so remember his family. It's Galatians 4, 1 through 20, and today is March 16th. Um, 
2022. Can you believe how time is moving on? Well, let's read some scripture together. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set, and that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic principle, spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father, now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Paul's concern for the Galatians. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, or should I say, now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? You are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. I fear for you, perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. For I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws. You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, you took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I am sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right, but let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives. I wish I were with you right now so I could change my tone. But at this distance, I don't know how else to help you. Powerful text. Well, as we look at the argument the Apostle Paul is bringing, really we kind of jump back into the text that we were in last week. Um, because, you know, just because there's a chapter break in your Bible doesn't mean it's an actual thought break or the end or the beginning of a thought. It may, could be the end of a thought. So chapter four, verses one through seven really are ending the thought that the Apostle Paul had been sharing that we are God's children through faith, not by works. And so he's been making this very clear. We cannot earn our salvation. And so he says, okay, let's let's kind of think of it another way. And, and he says, really, the key thought here is the gospel is in full effect. I'm sorry. The gospel is in full effect. 
And so he says, we need to think of it like this way. We need to get our minds wrapped around what it really looks like to be a Christian, what it really looks like to know Jesus, what it really looks like to be his child, because you've kind of got your mind in a wrong place. Well, it's a way to think. Now, we can get our minds in wrong places. Often we get tied up in our own thoughts or maybe thoughts that were placed upon us by our parents or some group or or something we read off the internet. And Lord help us, we seem to be overwhelmed by everything we read on Facebook. Like it is the absolute gospel. It is absolute truth. Be careful, my friends, because everything you read, no matter where you find it, may not be absolute truth. Unless you open a Bible, I can help you there. Open God's word. Quit listening to the nonsense that is out there in the world and believing it controls everything. It knows everything. It's not so. God knows everything. God is in control, and we need to think his thoughts. So Paul says, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up. And so he says, (laughs) even though they actually own everything their father had, they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. And he said, so you need to get your head around this. Um, Even though our father owns everything and wanted that to be our inheritance, when we were under the law, uh, following after these principles, um, we were we were living as slaves, and that language is so intense. One of my sons said, really, we're not to use that word anymore. My wife, I think, maybe shared that with me. Someone did um, that, that, that had an impact on me. That word slave is a very brutal way of thinking about things and a derogatory word if you think about what slavery looked like and what it was. And so what, what Paul says, listen, Before Jesus came, you were just a slave. You were in absolute bondage. You were being controlled by things that weren't of God. You were being controlled by the basic spiritual principles of this world. And so he says, we need to get our mind away from that. Well, the good news still, it's still good news. It never stops being good news. Knowing Jesus and knowing what he did for us and how it should affect us is powerful. It's the gospel in full effect. So what is the gospel? But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. The good news is God sent his son. He sent his son in the period of the law to redeem us, to fulfill the law, to purchase us so that we could be made, we could be adopted into the family of God. God chooses to adopt us. God wants us in his family. That is still the good news. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. Well, and the Father knows best. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And that means Daddy. Uh, Daddy. Uh, crying out to him, Dad, Daddy. And and Jesus said, this is the way you're to, to even come before God. He is your loving, heavenly Father. He is not um, something far removed, but he is very close. He is very personal. He is very engaged. He is not an absent father. He is a daddy. He is dad with us. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. And listen, the father knows best. What did the father know was best for us? To make us no longer slaves, but his own child. And since we are his child, God has made you his heirs. That means we get everything he has and he wants it to be ours. Well, the gospel of Jesus, the really good news, is that we are now God's children and he is our daddy, as in a very personal father. 
We need to grasp that. That's the the gospel. That's the good good news. And it's a reimagined childhood. I know I didn't say that, verses 1 through 7. Uh, a reimagined childhood. Paul says, you didn't even know how good it could be. I want you to think of it this way. It's a reimagined childhood. Well, then he says, you know what? You just want to go back to the orphanage. You don't want to be adopted. You don't want to be in this amazing family. You want to be alienated from God. You want to be away from God. So he said, let's let's think about this. Well, the key thought is an attempt to earn God's favor, an attempt to earn our salvation, an attempt to get God to love us. Well, guess what? God loves you no matter what. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, demonstrating the love of God. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And yet we think, if I can be good enough, if I can check enough boxes, I can earn my salvation. I can earn God's favor. No, (laughs) that's not how it works. So let's look at a few verses here. Do you remember how bad it was? Hey, can just stop a second. Do you remember your life before Christ? Do you remember how bad it was? Do you remember the pain, the frustration, the guilt, uh, the despair? Um, did you remember the heartache before you knew Christ? And and I hope that you know that there has been a change that has taken place in your life. Before you Gentiles knew God, you were slaves to so-called gods that don't do not even exist. You were a slave before Christ, and you belonged to gods that didn't even exist. You had placed idols before you, who knows? Maybe it was wealth, uh, maybe it was power, maybe it was a certain person, it, it was a title. We placed all these idols before us and said they were our God, and we worshiped that God, we served that God. It could have even been alcohol, it could have been drugs, it could have been uh, so many other vices. You were slaves to so called gods that do not even exist. So now that you know God, <laughs> Or should I say, now that God knows you, why do you want to go back again and become slaves once more to the weak and useless spiritual principles of this world? Why would you want to go back to being a slave? It doesn't make sense. Now you want to earn your freedom? And he says, you are trying to earn favor with God by observing certain days or months or seasons or years. Why are you trying to do this? Why do you think if I can check enough boxes, God will be pleased with me? It's a matter of faith. Abram believed God and God credited him as righteousness, credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham's faith made him right with God before he did anything. He believed God, and God equated that with righteousness. Later, Abraham would walk in faith with God and do as God had commanded him. But this is way before the law was given through Moses. This was all about a relationship, not a bunch of rules. And so verse 11, I fear for you, perhaps all my hard work with you was for nothing. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things. And so listen, you can't earn your salvation. And so he says, do you not hear a word I've said? I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things, for I have become like you Gentiles, free from those laws." Paul says, live in freedom, don't live as a slave, live in a relationship with Jesus. Well, freedom should not be taken for granted, nor should there be an attempt to earn it once it is given. Listen, once you've been set free, once you're standing outside the prison, would you go back to the prison guards or the prison warden and say, listen, now that I'm out, I want to earn my freedom here. Let me give you some money or let me do something for you. That is absolutely insanity. It's kind of like going back to before daylight savings time. Well, finally, and graduation day. What is it that God wants from us? He wants us to grow up in our relationship with him as our dad, as our heavenly personal father who who has poured out his son's spirit into our hearts. You you remember that song? 
I've got uh, the love of God, love of God. Where? Down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. Listen, why do we sing that? Well, it's right out of the Bible. God has placed the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Well, graduation day, key thought is a grateful heart filled with joy. A grateful heart filled with joy. That's verse 15. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? And so Paul says, listen, you used to have it. <laughs> back, Get back to where you belong. Now, I think that's a Beatles song or a phrase from a Beatles song. But listen, if you knew Christ and you're trying to go back before you knew Christ and live trying to earn your salvation, get back to where you belong. Get back to faith. Get back to loving God. Get back to being in a relationship with God. Get back to loving Him for loving Him's sake. Listen, you can't earn it. You can't earn your salvation. You can enjoy it. You can have a grateful heart filled with joy, but you can't earn it. And so the Apostle Paul says in verse 12, he says, You did not mistreat me when I first preached to you. Surely you remember that I was sick when I first brought you the good news, when you heard me preach. But even though my condition tempted you to reject me, you did not despise me or turn me away. No, he says took me in and cared for me as though I were an angel from God or even Christ Jesus himself. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? I'm sure you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if it had been possible. Have I now become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? He says, get back to that place of joy and gratefulness. Do you remember what it was like when you met Jesus, that joy that filled your heart? Well, get back to that. He says, you really, really had it. You had what it is. And he said, um, you would have, well, let me get back to this, verse 15 again. Where is that joyful and grateful spirit you felt then? He said, you really had it. It wasn't made up. And he said, you know, one of the evidences of really belonging to Jesus is I, it, it becomes, it plays out in how we love others. The greatest commandment is to love God. And the second is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, you know, when I came to you, I looked rough. I mean, there was no reason you should you should have been like, hey, get away from me. But you took me in. And we often feel that Paul's thorn in the flesh had something to do with his eyesight or his vision. And it's this reference. He said, you would have taken out your own eyes and given them to me if possible. He says, that's how we know you had this love of Christ in your heart. You were loving God and you were loving others, even to the point of willing to sacrifice for others. Well, and we all must grow up. Those false teachers are so eager to win your favor, but their intentions are not good. They are trying to shut you off from me so that you will pay attention only to them. If someone is eager to do good things for you, that's all right. But let them do it all the time, not just when I'm with you. And I looked this up. There's a phrase in there. It was an ancient Greek phrase that it was kind of like, um, do good all the time. And Paul says, well, if you want to do good all the time, do good. Don't just do good some of the time. And he said, these false teachers are only doing good some of the time. And he says, they're leading you away from doing good. And so really, it's, it's uh, I don't know what the phraseology is when it's the opposite of. But Paul says, listen, they're talking about doing good. They, they're they not up to any good. Oh, my dear children, I feel as if I'm going through labor pains for you again. And they will continue until Christ is fully developed in your lives until Christ is fully developed in your lives. Listen, do we need a bunch of rules? Do we need to keep learning rules or do we need to know Christ? Do we need to allow his spirit that is invading, filling our hearts to continue to grow until he He pours out of our hearts into our mouths and into our minds and into our eyes and into our hands and into our feet? We all must grow up into Christ. We are to be Christians, which means Christ-like. That is the calling 
upon us. We've all got to grow up. Well, a relationship with Jesus changes a person from the inside out and is evident. One more night with the frogs is our feeble attempt to earn what is freely given often because we think there has to be more to it than there is. More to this salvation than receiving it by faith. Our God is a gracious Father who loves us and longs for us to come to Him as a doting dad, a personal father, a, a, a present father, not an absent dad, not a deadbeat dad, but a present loving father. Attempting to earn His love by jumping through imaginary hoops does not increase His love, but often stunts our growth in grace. Because when we're trying to jump through hoops and trying to do this and that, we forget He loves us and we should just be with Him and enjoy His love. Our real goal is to allow Jesus full access into our lives until He has fully developed us into, a, into real adults, or better yet, His fully adopted children. Would you want to go back to your life before Jesus? Have you gone back to your life before Jesus? It is never too late to cry out to your heavenly dad, Abba, Father, he is waiting. Isn't that great news? God is waiting on us to cry out to him. He wants us to come to him by faith. And he says, you know what? You can't earn this. It is a free gift. And my son came for you, and he was willing to die for you so that I, Father God, could adopt you back into my family. And then he goes, Paul goes on to say, you are his children. And hey, we've been adopted, and we did it by faith. We received it. Live in that adopted place of having the perfect family, the perfect father. Hey, he's better than you can imagine. And maybe he wants you to reimagine even your own childhood which is your whole life as a child of God. Hey, let's pray together. Father God, we say Father. We say Abba Father. We say Dad. And Lord, we often feel very uncomfortable calling you Dad. And yet Jesus knew you as Dad. And Lord, you want us to be in that kind of relationship with you, a tender, compassionate relationship, knowing that we are loved, just because we're your kids. And so, Lord, help that to soak in. Help us to put away anything that would be a hoop that would stun our growth, trying to prove who we are, when we can just enjoy being who we are and just being your kids. Lord, you let that sink in. And, Lord, if there's any, any of my friends out there that have been trying to earn it or just can't believe it, just can't believe it's received by faith, Lord, open their hearts just to know you, to experience you, to enjoy you, and to know, Jesus, that you have been poured into our hearts till you overflow. And Jesus, I would ask for me and all of my friends that you would just overflow in our hearts, that it would be so evident even as we care for others. And so, Jesus, you do it. You do for us what we cannot, we'll never be able to do for ourselves, and we will praise your name uh, throughout eternity. And Jesus, we pray in your name and for your sake. And let all God's kids say together, amen, amen. Well, maybe you woke somebody up on the couch. I don't know. Somebody in the next room. Here's the blessing. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus comes. God will get it done. Let him. God bless you.